On September the 3rd, 2009, Frank Holloman, now president of Natural Land Trust, spoke to the 2009 Master Naturalist class at Stump House Tunnel. Um, we have a special guest. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Frank Holloman here, who's going to talk about saving Stump House, and I'm going to let him do his own introduction. All right, great. Thank you uh, for having me here to talk about one of my favorite subjects. I'm going to have the pleasure today to talk to you about Stump House, and I want to talk to you about a little history a little uh, uh, talk about how this happened and then uh, I want to at least raise some observations about uh, what this means for conservation because all of you are learning about uh, the natural world and I think uh, once you learn just one millionth of one percent about the natural world you almost automatically become conservationist at least in your heart and what I hope is to draw some observations about what we can all do to conserve our natural world at this critical point in our history. So first of all, this is Stump House Mountain. How many of you had ever heard of Stump House Mountain before you signed up? <clears throat> How many of you had not heard of it? Well, we, generally we have information, knowledgeable, some knowledge about it, so let me tell you at least uh, what I know. Uh, some of Stump House Mountain's history is history and some is legend and so, and it blurs together so uh, just keep that in mind as I go through this but uh, I think the naturalists will tell you this is not literally part of the Blue Ridge Mountain chain some people say this is a Monadnock or some people at least I've had some naturalists say oh no you know this is not literally part of the mountain chain this is but as far as I'm concerned, it's part of the Blue Ridge Escarpment and part of the, it's the public face of the Blue Ridge Mountains as you head up from Wahala toward North Carolina. Um, its history, as you know, is before any, uh, before the Europeans showed up, the uh, Native Americans were here. And I guess the last Native Americans to be here were the Cherokee. Uh, and there are still Cherokee in Oconee County. Did you know that? There, there's a, and in the upstate, the Cherokee Bear Clan is not part of the eastern band of the Cherokee Nation, you know, all these uh, legal definitions, but it is uh, a group of Cherokee in South Carolina, and they are building a monument in front uh, at the uh, Wahala uh, Oconee County Courthouse now. It's an active group, and they were active in our efforts. Uh, they still hold ceremonies here and consider this a sacred site. Uh, sometimes uh, collect herbs and things and they hold uh, uh, funeral ceremonies here and uh, consider this, there, there are Cherokee buried here. Uh, there's an old history of Oconee County by Colonel James at the turn of the 20th century and he refers to the Cherokee necropolis using the old Victorian term, the burial site near the Wahala water, uh, watershed. So uh, the Cherokee were here. You may have heard of Issaquina. How many have heard of Issaquina? How many know the history of Issaquina? Well, Issaquina, you know, is part history and part legend, and it's hard to tell which is which, but uh, the story is there was indeed a uh, young Indian woman named Issaquina, or named something, probably Issaquina. She, it is thought, was not a Cherokee, probably a Creek who was captured by the Cherokees and grew up with the Cherokees. You may know the Cherokees and Creeks fought. Uh, Alabama and Georgia was sort of Creek territory, and Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina were Cherokee territory, and they had boundary disputes. In fact, I've been told that the Saluda you know, the Saluda River in Greenville, it gets its name, according to one story I recently read, uh, from a tribe that the Cherokee brought down to be a buffer between them and their uh, rivals, and then the Saluda moved back and uh, retained the uh, name for that river. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But anyway, it illustrates the conflict. Well, anyway, um, the story is Issaquina lived in the Kiwi village, which was the capital of the Cherokee in this area, which is now underwater, um, and that she, uh, the nearest 
trading post was a trading post at what is now called 96. And that she fell in love uh, with an English trader, John, does anybody remember his name? Gowdy. Used to, who? Gowdy. No, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's the legend. Now, that may be the fact. I can't remember. I, I used to know all this when we were going through it. But anyway, she fell in love with him during the trading contacts. And while she was up in the Kiwi village, she heard the Cherokees say they were fed up with the British and they were going to go down there and wipe them out. Cherokee were, you know, a strong warrior uh, tribe. And so the legend is that, now this is probably part legend. I think it is believed there was a historical figure, Issaquina, and she indeed uh, was a couple with an English Englishman at the trading post. But the legend is she jumped on her pony and she rode to the trading post to warn him. And that's why you have all these names in the upper part of South Carolina that are numbers. So you've got six miles. That's six miles on her path. You have 12 Mile River, which I'm involved in in Pickens County right now. That's supposedly 12 miles. You've got 3 and 20 and 6 and 20. Ultimately, you have 96. And supposedly 96 was the 96 miles that Issaquina rode on her pony to warn her lover. She succeeded in warming, warning him. He survived. They got together. And then they moved to this mountain and built a house supposedly made of Stumps. And that's why it's called Stump House Mountain. Now, part of this we're getting into legend probably here. Uh, now, the truth is, all those towns are named those numbers, and I think most historians believe they are, they are based on the distance from the old Kiwi capital of the Cherokee to these various points. So, 96 was an English trading post, as you know, better than I do. And it was approximately 96 miles from the old Kiwi capital. Uh, but anyway, this legend uh, is partly based on a poem and a song that was created in the ni late 19th century by some poet. Any event, they're living up here. They have a child. And the Cherokee figure out they're here. And the Cherokee decide they want revenge. And they come up here to take care of Issaquina. And she jumps out to the waterfall, and here the legend has two uh, forks. Uh, one is that she jumped off the falls and got in a ledge, and the Cherokees thought she'd been killed, and so they retreated. The other theory is that uh, the Cherokees believed evil spirits lived in waterfalls, and so she jumped down to that first ledge and got behind the water, and they were scared to go after her. They knew she was there. Anyway, they fled. She survived and the falls bear her name, Issaquina. At that point, she and her husband, John, had thought discretion was the better part of valor, and they left here and went to Alabama to Creek Territory. And I'm told by my friend Buzz Williams, who's quite a historian, there is a historical figure, a Creek Maiden, who moved here with her English uh, husband to Alabama. And there are records of them in Alabama. So there's some truth to all this, uh, but it's a great legend, regardless of the exact truth. <laughs> and it's a big part of our history, so that's why Issaquina Falls bears its name. Uh, this is the first property, the old Germ one of the first properties the old Germans bought when they moved up here with the German Colonization Society. They bought uh, some of the property where Issaquina Falls is. It was owned by John Wagner. Uh, how many, any Wahollands here, other than my wife? Anybody else? Walhalla, you know, is Garden of the Gods. Valhalla, it was settled, founded by the Germans. They came here after all of us Celtic fringers who came here, the Scotch-Irish and the Welsh and the Ir some Irish showed up and the English. Uh, but that's one of their first properties. And then uh, we have one of the most famous legends with this tunnel. How many people know the history of the tunnel? Does everybody know that? I'll quickly go over it. John C. Calhoun had the bright idea this is how he was going to win the Civil War before it ever happened right here. Some people might say this. It wasn't uh, uh, um, the battle in Pennsylvania and uh, uh, Gettysburg were not the key battles. This was the key battle. This is where the Civil War was lost before it ever broke out. John C. Calhoun's theory was the North was 
you know, industrializing, growing. The key thing was who would connect with the Middle West, and his theory was connect the agricultural markets of the, in the port of Charleston of the South with the Midwest and its growing power, and you'd win the day. So his idea was build a railroad from Charleston to Knoxville and then to Cincinnati. And if that had succeeded, you know where you'd be standing today? The sh you'd be standing in a city the size of Chicago. That's the theory. <laughs> this would have been the major northwest, north, south, east, west terminus of railroads in America, supposedly. So his theory was build a railroad from there to the Midwest. But guess what? To do that, you had to go through these mountains. And Ann always says, what was he thinking? This was just the start. This is just the first mountain. How were they going to do it? Well, supposedly Calhoun himself did some of the surveying, etc., up here. It was discussions of putting the railroad through Greenville instead of through here. It came through here. They came here, and to build this railroad, they brought in immigrants who were Irish. And that's why Wahala is one of the few little, when I was growing up, little, most little southern towns were all pro virtually all Protestant. You know, there'd be a smattering of other people, but most little southern towns in South Carolina did not have their own Catholic church. Wahala's always had a Catholic church, even apart from Clemson University. And the reason they did was all these Irish immigrants were brought here to build this tunnel. And they built it with picks and black powder. See, this is, remember, this is 1850s. Had it succeeded, it would have been the longest railroad tunnel in the world. And the state spent, I think, three times its budget trying to do this railroad. And it was lit, there are remnants of it all the way up to here. And the, it experienced bankruptcy right here. This tunnel was not completed, but it's phenomenal what was built. The owners of the railroad had all these Irish immigrants here, and the, there was actually a city here called Tunnel Town. There's an old Irish cemetery on Jack, near Jack Lombard's house in Mountain Rest. Um, and the, how we have the Catholic Church here is the owners of the railroad, or the people who were overseeing it, they had a pretty rowdy crowd up here in Tunnel Town. All these guys, Irish immigrants up here building this railroad. And so they said, we got to do something, so they imported a priest. <laughs> so we had our Oconee County, what was then not Oconee County, I guess it was the Pickens District had their first Catholic priest right here uh, to try to get everybody under control. The railroad failed. The tunnel failed. We still have the tunnel. We have our Catholic church. We have another piece of stump house history. Civil War occurred in the north and the Midwest beat the south. So right here is where it was decided in, in, in one theory anyway. And then you know, I guess everybody here knows since you're in a Clemson sponsored program, right? Is the Master Naturalist still sponsored in part by Clemson? You must know this is where Clemson learned to make blue cheese because it has a steady temperature in the 50s. They still don't make it here. They now make it in a scientific more scientific way, but this is where uh, they made blue cheese, first learned to make blue cheese. So this area has a lot of history to it, has a lot of flavor, and has a lot of emotional connection to the community, as well as its beautiful natural history. This waterfall, as you know, is one of South Carolina's signature sites. Well, all of us thought it's part of the National Forest, right? I mean, driving up here, you saw Andrew Pickens National Forest, right? You saw that sign. And you drove in, you saw City of Wahala Park. We thought, hey, it must be a state park. Tim Lee must be responsible for this. <laughs> or the Secretary of Agriculture must be. It's a national forest. But guess what? All this was private property. The park is on private property. It's a city park. Uh, but it was on an oral lease that could be terminated on 30 days notice or 90 days notice. I heard different things. The only publicly owned property was the actual tunnel is owned by Clemson University and the little road that goes out to the highway is owned by Clemson. Everything else is private property here. Now there is a National Forest property right up here which I'll show you in a minute but what we think of as Stump House Mountain was all private. Well I was sitting at my desk in January 2007 and the phone rang, and it was my friend Bill Sharpton. 
and some of you know, I know one, two, three know him, four. And Bill has deep voice like this. He's retired textile chemical salesman. And he said, Frank, sit down. <laughs> You're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. And I said, well, Bill, I am sitting down. Go ahead. And I was out there just, you know, I was working on something. Mind a million miles away. And he says, Wahala is going to sell Stump House Mountain. Well, you know, do they own it? First question. <laughs> Second, who would think of such a thing? He said, yeah, they do own it, and they're going to sell it. And uh, there's going to be a public hearing tonight. The way we knew there was a public hearing that shows you how things interact is that there's a guy, John Cothran. John's father was once the chief uh, park superintendent. superintendent of Oconee State Park. He grew up here, and he is now a st guy who works with stones. The Native Plant Society, of which Bill and I are members, has been working with Oconee State Park and the Forest Service to do the trail at Oconee Station uh, Falls. If y'all haven't been there, if you're master naturalists, that's one thing you got to go. It's very easy to go to. It's second most important wildflower site. And John had been working there, and so Bill had been gotten to know John. He was doing our stones for that effort. John lives in Wahala. He had he heard there was a public hearing that night by the city of Wahala whether to sell Stump House Mountain. So he called Bill. Bill called me. Bill called the other people in the Native Plant Society. And I said, well, Bill, I know we don't, we don't live there, and I'll tell you this story in a minute. So I said, but we got to go and say something. You know, maybe it's a done deal, but we cannot let this happen and not say anything. You know, that would be, we'd never forgive ourselves. This, when's the hearing? It's tonight. It's in three hours. <laughs> you know, and so I called a friend of mine who might know something, and he said, well, I've talked to somebody about this. They say it's a done deal. And there's really nothing that we can do. And I said, well, that may be true, but we can at least go say something. You know, we can't just not do nothing. Can't do, just do nothing. And so he said, I don't see any harm in that and his strategic advice. So we got in the car and over we came. Now this was no great coordinated effort. I've told you how we heard that, right? <laughs> we get here and Wahala City Council meets in a small chamber and there were people everywhere you know, spilling out into the lawn. So there were probably 50, 75 people at this little meeting that people really just heard about by word of mouth. And I think a couple of people may have come there to speak in favor of it, but as we got started, everybody there was against it. So the two who might have been for it decided not to speak. <laughs> and it became clear there that uh, a majority of, were against it. And just to cut to the chase, apparently what uh, according to news reports and what we could pick up, there was a developer from Georgia and Florida who was proposing to build a gated community here and had conceptual plans. Issaquina Falls, you would think, was a state park. It, it was also on private property. The tunnel was not actually going to be bought because it was owned by Clemson University, but all this area around it would be, and I'll show you a map in a minute. Um, and so... It had been through one or two readings. They were right. It was, you know, it was on path to quite possibly happen, although a decision had not yet been made because they had to have a public hearing and then a vote. So then began the community learned about it and there was an uproar and the council members were, we, we knew them. And by the way, I came over and spoke, but I wasn't totally an alien. Uh, because Ann and I both grew up in Oconee County and in Wahala, me and Seneca, but my grandfather was the mayor of Wahala uh, at the turn of the century, past century. Uh, and we were, uh, we were married in Wahala. In fact, two of the council members were at our wedding. Uh, so we were not total strangers by any means to the situation. Uh, so, uh, and of course knew this area well. Uh, so after that meeting, the people who were just there gathered in the lawn and said, we've got to do something. So we resolved to begin organizing and met a few days later at the uh, uh, American Legion hut. And, a, and we had all the 
local people, a former county councilman, a local group uh, headed by Eddie Martin who runs a feed and seed store called Oconee Protection United Trust, something like land trust, local land trust. And then we had the important help of the Nature Conservancy and Upstate Forever and a critical role played by DNR, which I'll tell you in a minute. And the Chattooga Conservancy, Buzz Williams. Uh, in the course of this, uh, Buzz and Harold Thomas, who was the former city county councilman, lives here, led an effort to get a uh, petition signed. And three times the number of people who voted in the last city election in Wahala signed the petition <laughs> to oppose the sale in just in the city. Then we had thousands of people from outside the city, in the county and in the region. Uh, we inund people inundated the city council with calls and letters, and the city council members, to their credit, were open to the consideration. The, you know, they, want, they, they did not make a decision. They waited to hear everything. They held two or three public hearings, one at Mountain Rest, one in county council chambers where a huge crowd of people showed up. Uh, and in the end, uh, press reports came out about the developer that were not very complimentary, and he pulled out of the deal. Well then, here we were, it's like the old man who chased the dog who chased the car. Well then, once he caught it, what did he do? <laughs> well, we, we had to figure out what to do. And here, let me show you the map so you can understand what I'm talking about. This is the Sumter National Forest. Now, ironically, under the last administration, this was one of those pieces of national forest that were often proposed to be sold. But that never happened. So this is a, a, a finger of the Sumter National Forest. This is the Wahala watershed. And so why did Wahala own Stumphouse Mountain? It used to obtain its water from a reservoir up here. And it was piped from the same creek that forms Issaquina Falls. And it used to be piped down to Wahala. So they still own the old reservoir, even though they no longer used it as a water source. And that's this, and that's really where, sort of where we're seated back that way and behind the tunnel. Here is the tunnel, and here's a little road. So it's right back behind that tunnel. And then we learned, we didn't know it at the time, that's about 500 acres, not quite, almost. And then we had learned there was a parcel like this owned by a private family and the developer had gotten, was talking to them to buy it too. So he was going to have a thousand acres that would more or less surround the tunnel and it's the Queen of Falls and he was going to gate it off and develop it. The, the front of the mountain that you see driving up would have been developed. And then the back of the mountain that you don't see driving up would have been developed. So then began an incredible effort uh, to assemble a land deal and raise the money to pay for it. We had to raise $4.3 million between March and August. Uh, and we had to assemble a very complicated real estate transaction because what we wanted to do was not merely protect this. We wanted to get the rail bed of the old Blue Ridge Railroad, which is the tra a trail right up here that has been used for years. And there are actually three tunnels on the mountain. This is one. But there are two more, and they're on this trail. One is right here, and one is right here, and they're great. One of them's great bat habitat, Mary will tell you. We wanted to get those two tunnels, and we wanted to protect this Aquina Falls, and we wanted to protect the city park. Well, the problem is, some of that was on this property, but some wasn't. This whole trail was not. I don't believe this tunnel was. This Aquina Falls was not. And most of the city park wasn't. Well, luckily for us, the, the family of the owners of this property and the family that owned the property in between had been longtime friends. Their grandfathers had been friends. And through the hard work of the Nature Conservancy and the Upstate Forever, we undertook a very complicated real estate transaction where there were a series of land swaps, acre for acre. So that in the end, we got the city park, Issaquina Falls, the entire rail bed that was involved, and the two tunnels. So we got 
all the historic side and we got this beautiful hardwood cove area in here that was this area in here uh, was not in the original parcel so we got this protected area between these two we didn't want the gap so we got this contiguous connection to the national forest and all of this we raised the 4.3 million uh, and everything was everybody's participation was critical DNR provided one and a half million dollars through the uh, Heritage Trust to buy this property to help pay for this property this we would never have done this transaction without the state conservation bank which is now zero funded almost zero funded but may come back luckily this was before that and they provided the entire funding for a conservation easement so the city of Wahala continues to own its own watershed but was paid 1.2 million dollars for a conservation easement so the city got a substantial amount of money and the property is protected from development forever and they can continue to use it for timber and also for water if they ever wanted it for water and recreation and DNR this I think is the only youth hunting wildlife management area area in five or six or more counties of the upstate Greenville Oconee Pickens Anderson and multiple counties DNR very much this wanted to retain this as a wildlife management area and it was able to do that as a result of this effort in addition to DNR's one and a half million dollars for this though, we had to raise a bunch more money in a few months. Um, PRT through the Land and Water Conservation Fund provided two hundred thousand um, and uh, we obtained twenty thousand from uh, the Heritage Corridor Fund of PRT and the rest of it except one important chunk came from the public. We went to foundations, we went to individuals. We had contributions from one dollar to three hundred thousand dollars from uh, individuals and foundations. We had two. We had a matching gift where, for every one dollar person gave, uh, it would be matched up to a total of three hundred for six hundred thousand dollars total. We had two old ladies in a nursing home who sent two one dollar bills, so they would be matched. Uh, we had another woman out of the blue we did not solicit her who contacted us and gave a ten thousand dollar gift in honor of her son who died we had a young girl who had a birthday party instead of gifts had them bring contributions to stump house and then we had foundations who gave a lot well we got to the end and we'd done everything we could think of and we were five hundred thousand dollars short two hundred thousand was going to be provided by this PRT grant but it had to be matched by local governmental funds so we went to Oconee County Council and uh, I don't have has anybody here been to a County Council meeting they deal with one headache after another I mean County can people who serve on County Council are to be admired because it's just one issue after another and they've got to try to find the funds for everything so we sat at that meeting to the very end listened to problems with the animal shelter with the road program with this that and the other and I thought well <coughs> what will happen so we made a presentation at the end we said we've gotten to the end of this fundraising campaign we need 200 to match PRT and they, I said, we think we can raise, uh, we need 115,000 more dollars. We're sure we can raise the 15. We don't know about the 100, but we're going to try. And the county councilman said now, so if we give you 300,000, that will finish this part of the campaign. And I said, yes. They said, okay, we'll give you 300,000. <laughs> they said, we don't know where we're going to get it from, but we'll do it. <laughs> and he said, you can let, we'll talk with the county manager, but you can leave here, Mr. Hallman, assured that we will provide the $300,000. And I think what they ended up doing was they borrowed, they had a reserve, they paid it out of the reserve, but they in effect are paying back their reserve through their accommodations tax over a period of years. I think that's what they did. So, as a result of that, we now have a conservation easement here and a beautiful, wonderful <laughs> Heritage Trust site under the care of Mary Bunch and DNR that is protected forever. Wahala has its city park that is protected forever under a conservation easement. And Issaquina Falls is protected forever under a conservation easement. For technical reasons, as far as you're concerned, it's one Heritage Trust Preserve. 
under the terms of the grant, some of this property is actually owned, I think, by the city of Wahala, not the county of Oconee. I forget how it worked, the city, but it, it is under a very strict conservation easement, much stricter than this one, that is the equivalent of a heritage trust site. So it's, as far as we're concerned, this is all one heritage trust site with a terrific trail, protected the view shed, connected to the national park, and the heritage of the area we hope is protected forever and we'll want to look for other opportunities to connect it up. So, oh and by the way, when we got the public involved, we had these signs <laughs> at one of the meetings. And uh, when the public got involved, not when we got them involved, they got involved and we handed out these signs and it was a terrific, uh, had a terrific effect on the news and the newspapers and then our built people's spirits up. And, uh, had, and this was our message. It didn't have to be much more complicated than that. If you want to see where this is, it's sort of, if you've done a strategic plan about a property to protect, you might have picked this out, but I assure you we did no strategic plan for this. <laughs> it just happened. But you see, here is the one branch of the National Forest coming up from Georgia, another branch of the National Forest coming down from North Carolina, and there was a hole in the middle. Guess what it was? Stump House Mountain. So we have sort of plugged this hole. It's not a perfect connection. There's a little gap here, but there is now pretty much a corridor connecting Mountain Rest is up in here, but connecting these two pincers of the National Forest. So it, it just worked out beautifully. Now what are some legends, uh, lessons before I take questions? Uh, one thing I learned was we didn't have to convince a single person except the city council members who had gotten into this uh, development plan, but once they you know, thought about it and saw the public reaction and listened, they changed their minds. But in terms of the public, we didn't have to convince anybody. Everybody that we ran into, except literally two or three people, were for protecting this area. And I guess what I would say is the depth of the public commitment and sentiment uh, about protecting our mountains and our natural areas, particularly those that have any history behind them, is very strong. But people need to know what to do to do it. I mean, so what? I mean, it's important. that feeling is important, but to the person, what can I do about it? So the second lesson is our conservation groups are very important. The Chattooga Conservancy that Buzz had all this knowledge from his work and knew how to organize and do petitions and all that. Upstate Forever had the technical expertise to put together the conservation easement proposal and design and get the grant from the Conservation Bank. And the Nature Conservancy had the resources. They signed a contract to buy that real estate from the private family with not, without having raised any of the money other than DNR's commitment. The remainder of the money, they didn't know how we were going to get it. They had the capacity as a large national group to do that. And then they had the capacity to help us do the fundraising effort and the real estate technical expertise to help put together this deal. And then we had all these other groups who helped raise interest, the Sierra Club, the Native Plant Society, uh, multiple other groups, and I'm sure I forget, the local Oconee County group. All those groups are important, so we need to support them uh, because otherwise we would have been dead. Uh, and then also what is important emphasize is the importance of our state natural resources agencies. Uh, had we not had the Conservation <coughs> Bank, this never would have happened. Because we couldn't have, how would we have gotten 1.2 million dollars like that to convince Wahala City Council this was a real deal? And they had to be convinced of that. And had we not had DNR and Heritage Trust, we would have not had the critical component of the funds, nor would we have had a place to place the property. I mean, what would we have done? We had to have the Heritage Trust system to look after it and deal with it from then on. And PRT helped us with critical funding. So we, it's so important to have that state conservation bank. You need to tell your local elected officials that. And it's so important to have these great natural resources agencies and support them in our, our concerns about state budgets and politics and all those things. Um, and the final point is this. 
you can make a difference. There are more people here than were at the first meeting at the um, American Legion Hut. And there are more people here than were at some of those meetings at St. John's Lutheran Church. And you all are much more knowledgeable than we started out as a group. Uh, but that group of people made it happen. If they hadn't done it, who knows what would have happened. Well, you know, you know what happened in the national economy. What if that guy had closed on this property, brought a bunch of bulldozers in here, started something, had the whole front face of that mountain cut up, and we have a financial collapse? We'd had a mess. The city council would have had a mess. Oconee County would have had a mess. It would have been a public embar could have been a public embarrassment. We would have lost this great treasure. It would have been a catastrophe. Those that small group of people not only avoided a problem, they produced such a great result for the overall community. Wahala has 1.2 million dollars. The conservation bank and DNR had a great accomplishment. We have this great resource for the community. You all are here. You all can do the same thing. You've got more resources here, so uh, I'm not saying this group go out and organize something, but you guys, in whatever groups and organizations you're in, can have the same effect. So those would be the points I would emphasize. The people believe in what you're doing here. The conservation groups are very important. We need to support them. Our natural resources agencies are important, and we need to support them, and you can make a difference. It happened here, there's no doubt about it. It came from the ground up, not from the